Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas. Their ongoing study in a philosophy of religion by Edgar Sheffield Brightman, published in 1940. We're going to take a look at our final lesson in the phenomenology of revelation. We're going to look at pages uh, 232 to 276, and it will uh, deal specifically with the response to revelation as the logic of faith. Let's take a look at block one. We're going to take a look at uh, religion and theory. And Brightman tells us that value experience is guided by the logic of faith. Phronesis and praxis need theoretical guidance. Theory is then applied to the concrete struggle between the forces in actuality. And the logic of faith is an allegiance to value on the part of the believer. The self experience experimentally posits the predominance of the good. The logic of faith is that experimental positing and interpretive construction. Now Brightman says we have to take a look at the problem of intrinsic evil, which challenges the conservation of values. There are evils involving human volition and those without human volition. The five key aspects of intrinsic evil are it is incoherent, it's exclusive in interest, it's uh, ignorant of God's will, it is separate from God's will, it is missing the mark or hamartia, and it uh, has no um, teleology of improvement. And instrumental evil is an abuse of freedom, it's uh, seeking natural desires or actually reasoning toward producing actual evil. So Brightman says in note 4, the negation of evil through the logic of faith reaches redemption. Religion is redemption from evil. The difficulty of achieving good is relig religion's chief task. Theory is philosophical, but religion is practical. Man's concentration on the supreme worth of existence is worship. And religion believes that the highest power is on the side of value. Religion must become a form of realistic action. It must become concrete. We want to take a look at that next. We want to take a look at the concrete side of the logic of faith. In block two, the practical and the applied logic of faith. How do we apply the positing, experimental positing and interpretive construction? experimental positing and interpretive construction. The logic of faith becomes the concrete dialectic of desire. The self seeks to further the dialectic of coherence by first seeking a desire for fulfillment. This gets challenged by a distorted desire for pleasure. Self then raises the positing to one for the permanence of value qualities. Brightman says all of these stages need to be examined in detail through the logic of faith with its return moment of interpretive construction. So we begin with a desire of possession. We begin with a desire for physical things, but we become eventually dissatisfied. The return moment of interpretive construction teaches that fulfillment is more about activity than it is about things. So then we move on to the uh, desire for activity. Without activity, there is no perception of value. The return moment of interpretive construction teaches us that activity must have a tele teleological end. This in turn involves social relation. So we move on to the desire for sharing. Desire becomes elevated. Consciousness for the respect of others emerges. The experiences of love and cooperation lead to a deeper understanding of the nature of desire. This in turn raises the desire for a standard to judge other persons. Value must enter the social experience. The return moment of interpretive construction teaches us that shared experience is a process of progressively realizing the ideals of kingdom. That is the teaching of the return moment of interpretive construction. Our shared experience is a process of realizing the ideals of kingdom. So we finally reach the desire for the ideals. The desire for ideals interpenetrates every stage of the logic of faith. 
It, it penetrates experimental positing. It penetrates interpretive construction. The logic of faith embodies our need for truth and our insight into standards. But for Breitman, abstract ideals must be verified through actuality. So he gives us the triad of verification, which consists of, first, the posited ideal reality, second, the given actual reality that includes evil, and then, third, the realized actual value. Ideals become perceived as super-social or transcendent. Brightman says ideals must be objectively transcendent and internal to personhood. Therefore, we do reinforce our concept of supreme person. The concept of God as subject is reinforced, says Brightman. So the logic of faith begins as theory, but the logic of faith becomes concrete dialectic of desire. And dialectic of desire is raised up to the desire for the ideals of the kingdom. So we do have, in this final lesson on Revelation, we have the fact that, yes, Revelation for Brightman must include the response to Revelation, which is the logic of faith, which is experimental positing and interpretive construction. The Aristotelian moment of experimental positing and the Hegelian moment of interpretive construction. That has to become concrete as the dialectic of desire which reaches for concrete realization of the ideals of kingdom. Now, Brightman, when he gets to this point, he's more or less concluded his discussion of Revelation and the response to Revelation. And the remainder of the book is going to take a look at Brightman's apologetics, which is basically Brightman taking on the problem of the theodicy question. So our third moment in this lesson is going to be the logic of faith and the theodicy problem. He's transitioning into his second half of the book, the apologetics of answering the theodicy question. We begin with worship and theory. God is perceived as conscious, spiritual person, and all present insight falls short of all inclusive knowledge. Therefore, the concept of God becomes our object of inexhaustible exploration. It's an exploration that takes place within the dialectic of revelation of spirit and the response of logic of faith. Endeavor becomes the self's ongoing act of worship, says Brightman. So it's revelation and response. Revelation and response. A response of the logic of faith. That dialectic logic of faith. We constitute the ideals through phronesis and praxis. We seek to establish worthful cooperation toward the actualization of value. We posit this experimental positing within a recognition of the seriousness of the negative. We do recognize this seriousness of the negative. Therefore, our logic of faith becomes Hegel's relentless guile of reason, says Breitman. We continue in the movement from value claim to true value to positive value. Value claim it has to be worked through that Dakunta threshold of dialogue, raising value claim to true value, and then positing true value as a coalescence of value as a positive sign value model to reach actualization. Three, realizing actual value in the face of evil. The good equals the principle of coherence and meaning. Evil is that which laughs at the logic of faith. Now, Accounting for evil, some answers given are misused freedom or its discipline. Brightman says those are inadequate. Hegel's incomplete good is inadequate. Necessary contrast to the good is inadequate. Macintosh's incomplete creation theory is inadequate. And just simply saying that we can't know why there's evil, even though we believe in a good God, Blaming it on human ignorance is unacceptable as well. So Brightman says all of these proposed theories for the presence of evil when we believe and posit the conscious living 
God of good, the theodicy problem, has to be addressed. And he says in note four, we're faced with a trilemma, a threefold dilemma of religion. The logic of faith is left with two choices, either theistic absolutism, where God is omnipotent and omnipresent and omniscient, or theistic finitism. Theistic finitism says that God is good but limited in power and knowledge. Brightman says, therefore, living religion, Christianity, must have three negations. We must negate agnostic humanism. We must negate theistic absolutism. We must negate theistic finitism. We must seek out a better possibility of answer for the theodicy problem. That's going to be the remainder of the book for Edgar Sheffield Brightman. The remainder of the book is going to address how religion must authentically seek a better possibility for answering the theodicy question. What will be our apologetics? But in this lesson, he does conclude his uh, phenomenology of revelation by realizing that we're speaking of a response of the logic of faith and the concrete raising of the logic of faith to the dialectic of desire. So he finishes with those two moments, logic of faith, dialectic of desire, and that concludes his discussion of the phenomenology of revelation. We had a composite look at the phenomenology of religion. We had a composite look at the phenomenology of value. We will follow this lesson with a composite look at the phenomenology of revelation, even though we've already looked at a composite view of Reitman's overall system. We will have an additional composite look following this lesson as the phenomenology of religion that we'll look at pages 172 to 276. And we're going to take a look at that one next, but just keep in mind that the triad here is a triad that introduces the second half of the manuscript, which is going to be apologetics or the question of theodicy. It's going to be the theodicy problem as a Christian apologetics. The first half of the book is a three-layered phenomenology. The second half of the book is answering the theodicy problem. So we get the conclusion to Revelation as logic of faith theory and dialectic of desire concrete realization. Response to Revelation. And that's going to wrap up this uh, lesson from... 232 to 276, and our next lesson is going to look at the summary composite look at the phenomenology of revelation.